Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody to the um, kickoff session for the Social Science Department's Black History Month Symposium. And we have a very uh, distinguished guest, so I'm gonna, not going to take too much time today. Uh, I'll let him um, take the show away. But I do want to let you know that we have a whole slate of opportunities available for you. Uh, there are some flyers as you exit on the right today that you're free to take with you. Um, we have uh, morning sessions, evening sessions that last throughout the week, so hopefully there are some other opportunities that you can avail yourself of. Uh, today's guest speaker is Dr. Matt Daly from Grand Valley State University, and he's going to be speaking on the activities of the Klan in Michigan. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Daly. Thank you. Well, good morning. Thank you for coming here with freezing rain and all the, uh, the, the goodies that February in Michigan can provide us. Um, this morning I was, I was looking, I've been working for a number of years on uh, projects relating to the uh, birth of the Ku Klux Klan, especially the second Ku Klux Klan, perhaps the one we remember the most from the 19-teens and 20s. And as you can see this morning, as my computer goes over to its, uh, to its favorite mode, um, if you see the, the Klansman's robe, this is perhaps one of the most significant uh, artifacts that uh, come out of that era and one of the most lasting symbols. And so you have the robe that's usually white. It has a peaked hood or a visor. It will have a red tassel at the tip. Uh, it's actually specified, and I have the specifications for it. The official costume shall be a white robe of lightweight cotton cloth and of proper length with white girdle around the waist and signa of the order worn on the left breast. The cowl, I love that word, or helmet, shall be made of the same material as the robe and whatever material to give it the proper stiffness and so that it should be collapsible. And when worn, it shall be a cone shape. Uh, there shall be one red tassel on the cone. On the cone. There shall be an apron of the same material so as to completely conceal the identity of the wearer. Very important. And costumes will be worn by active officers of whatever rank or station shall be of such design and made of such material and with the use of such symbols as specified by the emperor. So this is a fairly, you know, pretty weird kind of idea is that you would actually spend a lot of time specifying what you want. In addition, you'll notice that there's an insignia here and it's a little hard to see. And it will be, it's the, usually what it is, is it's an, uh, some would argue that it's originally an, a white X. Because if you ever look at images, and we'll see a few of them, the images are sometimes either it's an X, as the cross of St. Andrews, uh, or it's the Confederate flag. Depends on how you want to interpret it, or it turns straight. I always wonder if it doesn't depend on the sewing ability of the person who puts it on. Uh, in addition... Uh, it also, if it was slanted, then it, was, it could be kind of Im the image of a crusader. In addition, you'll have the red background and the red drop almost, uh, re almost definitely represent blood. So you'll have the red background, but then you have like a little red drop in the middle of, of the cross. And there's a whole bunch of meanings for that. One is that it is uh, blood spilt by the South in the American Civil War. Another is the blood spilled uh, by African Americans uh, of the white race. Uh, the blood of some unnamed female victim of a supposed crime. That's something that comes out of the birth of the nation, the film. Or the blood of Christ at the crucifixion. And that's going to be another kind of interpretation that comes through. Uh, these are very rare. This is actually from over at the Public Museum of Grand Rapids. Uh, they, this is a fairly rare item to find. And the question comes up frequently when I discuss this, why would you save this thing? Why would a public institution have one? Um, frankly, you won't buy them on eBay, I can tell you that much. eBay has an algorithm that will automatically boot out anything that's along this sort of line. But the reason that this is important to be kept is that for many uh, uh, chances to, 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 to look at this, it is a harsh thing to look at, but it also is important is that you can deny it very easily. It's much harder to deny something that you can look at, you can touch, you have a real sense of authenticity. That's a very difficult thing. That's partly why we have museums. It's not enough to go there. Um, if you want to think about another example, uh, and this is very controversial, is the Holocaust. Uh, having actually walked at Auschwitz, someone asked me, they said, so what do you think? And I went, oh yeah, I have no doubt in my mind that it, it happened. I'm a former engineer, and I kind of stood there and looked around, and I went, yeah, that's about right. And it's pretty frightening. And it's very disturbing, the mountains of shoes and all these sorts of things. Same way for the Klan. When you look at that, uh, there's no denying that that has a power to it that we still have with us today. There are fairly few of these left. 
most have been destroyed, especially after the civil rights movement of the 1960s. This has such implied meaning. You know, I don't even have to tell you what it is. I mean, I have my caption up there, but you wouldn't need me to tell you about it. You would sit there and go, right, we've got that. Yep, we know exactly what that is. But on the other hand, it's very rare for us to see it. So it does make sense to hang on to this. Um, this are, so there's a couple of things I wanted to go through as well. And let me back up here. Um, one of the things that we also we talk, often think of is that the Klan doesn't just emerge from nothing. That's a very critical idea. One is that there have been three Ku Klux Klans and that they are not just in the South. That's a critical component. We love to, and especially here in Michigan, we love to think of it as it's down there, wherever there is. Indiana can be south. I mean, how far south do you want to go? On the other hand, this is uh, an entity that's had three lives. It still goes on. Uh, the first is after the Civil War, and it is going to be predominantly uh, geared against the freed people, the freed African Americans, the former slaves. That will be uh, a very powerful entity, but it's not really very organized. It's not a monolith. There are orders of the White Camellia, the White Legion, the Legion of Civil Decency. Um, there's going to be a very variety of these, and there's going to be the Exalted Order of the Knights Ku Klux Klans. Uh, that's going to be around, but it's going to be pretty much crushed down in the 1870s. But even that image of a knight rider, the images of people who have a hood. Now, most of us think about what we see uh, from Birth of a Nation. And we think of it as everyone had a white robe, the hat, the classical image, all the way back in the 1870s. Well, that's some did, most didn't, because these are very loosely organized. All it meant was you put a mask over your head, a burlap bag it would do with the eye holes, and you would go ahead and you would ride and you would inflict terror. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan, the White Order, the White Camellia, all these sorts of things, you can think of them as a form of, frankly put, as one uh, scholar has really argued very choicely, domestic terrorism. It's a way to go out there and wield a campaign of terror to suppress one group from asserting its rights as guaranteed by the Constitution. We love the Constitution in the United States. What it means and how you implement those pretty words, that's the difficult part. Now, when we go into the 1890s, as I frequently tell my students uh, at Grand Valley and, and uh, at OSU when I taught there and all that good stuff is, they didn't come out of nowhere. They didn't just wake up one morning and go, oh, we're going to form a clan with a cone-shaped hat, and we're going to go, yeah, they didn't do that. This rose out of a, a broad range of context, which you'll get tired of me saying, speaking of. But when we look at it, it comes out of a, a time, the 1890s, when there was a massive backlash against immigration. Uh, the immigration that starts in the mid-1880s and begins to really pick up to the 1890s, into the turn of the century, is going to, is going to not be uh, Irish and German uh, French, the Northern European uh, component. Uh, it's going to be much more Southern and Eastern European. Uh, for those of us who, uh, uh, who, are, who are really interested in this, uh, something to keep in mind. Uh, one of the great questions that historians struggle with today is the definition of whiteness. When did the Irish become white? Uh, and I always, I always remind you, remember, the Irish, you would go, well, they're, they're from the British House. Yes. But for most, until really until the 1920s and 30s, you know, this is going to be a, a northern, Anglo-Saxon, uh, 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 English-speaking, Christian, practicing Roman Catholicism, uh, immigrant group who will be viewed as not being white. If you would ask them, they would say, that's not, they're not part of us. And so that's kind of a, of a trippy thought. We've wielded these sorts of ideas against other groups for a long time. Now when you have Southern and Eastern Europeans, many of them Jews coming from the, uh, the pale section of, of Southern Russia, which would be today the Ukraine and parts of Belarus and the like, where you put up with the Russians, literally push them down to that area. Why? Because that's where usually if the Europeans are going to invade, they're going to come invade right through there. So they're going to burn and kill Jews instead of good Russian citizens. So they're going to be, so people are going to say, hmm, we have a choice. We can leave. Absolutely. Italy. Italy will be uh, unified as a country, but an economic basket case. Uh, so they're going to leave there. You're going to leave Romania. And when you come to the United States, and by the way, this is 1891, there's no Ellis Island. This is um, Castle Gardens, which is actually being rebuilt today at the foot of Battery Park in, in Manhattan, New York. You're going to have all these folks come in, and the sense is, is that what you have down here is it says mafia from, in New Orleans, anarchists in Chicago, socialists in New York. That these are all these undesirables. They're not us. 
the 1890 census says that the frontier is closed and there's going to be huge rage about that, especially for historians. Uh, uh, Frederick Jackson Turner, who puts forward the Turner thesis of the frontier in a very hot, I'm, I'm underneath this, this, this heat here, so I'm kind of warm, so I feel appropriate for it. 1893 Chicago World's Fair. Turner gets up and he, and he ish, delivers his uh, frontier in American history thesis. And the thesis says, guess, in essence, guess what? The frontier is closed. You can't move west anymore. It's all downhill from here. We've always had a frontier. And once you lose that, industrialization, urbanization will destroy us. So all these folks coming in, it's all downhill from here. Now, that doesn't work out quite that way. Uh, and certainly we, we know that to be so today. On the other hand, that's a very kind of a gloomy, pessimistic idea. And it's going to begin to turn inward. Do you intermarry with these new uh, immigrants? Do you deal with these people? Especially Roman Catholicism, which has the image that uh, even into the 1960s, will the, the, all of the elected official take their orders from the Pope in Rome? Americans love conspiracy theories. We delight in them. They help explain the unexplainable. So you're going to have this sort of real concern about immigrants. Well, to that end, one of the things that comes out of this is you have African Americans. And African Americans are going to be heavily isolated in the South. As the First World War uh, begins to pick up, you begin to have the first great migration. And it starts before then. And the first great migration uh, of African Americans moves north. My mother's family, by the way, was something we don't tend to think about. There were also Southern whites who moved north as well. My mother's family being one of them that left Mississippi and came to work in the auto plants of Detroit. So they came right along with everyone else. And so part of the idea is, is that for African Americans, here's an odd position for them. They are not of, technically for, the, with the, for that racialist sort of idea, the nativist, that it should be you know, white, Anglo-Saxon, uh, Protestant, WASPs is the wonderful acronym. Everything should have an acronym. Uh, African Americans are an interesting, interesting kind of position because African Americans are born in the United States. They are defined as citizens. They speak English. They practice overwhelmingly Protestantism. So, you know, if you... If it wasn't for the sort of racial component, if you think about it, they would fit in quite nicely with the predominant kind of idea that we don't like Catholics and we don't like these immigrants. But you throw race on top of that and a visible sense of identity, the one drop rule, Jim Crow. You begin to build all of these sorts of components and you're able to isolate that. In addition, you'll have Booker T. Washington. Uh, the, the, who, is, who we don't really tend to view as favorably today as at one time, but he's important too. Washington, in his Atlanta exposition speech in 1895, says, cast down your bucket. Cast down your bucket. And he speaks to these white businessmen among us. And he goes right on to say, don't bring it into these new immigrants. Don't look to them. He's playing the anti-immigrant card himself. That's something we don't think about. That's kind of an interesting thought. We've begun to kind of begin to some of that sort of divide and conquer, split people up and play it against them. We don't do that anymore, do we? No. In any event, so one of the answers that many of, of civic and community leaders, both in Grand Rapids, in Detroit, in New York, do is their sense is we need to deal with the impact of urbanization and all these sorts of ideas. So they begin to create a, a kind of a, of a, a mishmash Messy, which is why historians love it because it's a train wreck, a kind of reform era called progressivism. What does progressivism mean? Who knows? It is the multi-purpose tool. I, always, I like Doctor Who, the, the science fiction show. It's a sonic screwdriver. It's anything you want it to be. It's a hammer. It's a screwdriver. It's a tool. It's an ideological concept. It does a lot of different things. But one of the things they do is they say, fellow citizens, what will you make of me? What kind of society will you create? One overrun by immigrants clinging to their old identity or one that integrates them fully into society, at least in rhetoric. So there's going to be a huge movement for Americanization of immigrants that you have for its $5 day. That's one of the great images. $5 day doesn't just mean you work for Henry Ford and he gives you $5. Mm -mm. Work for him for six months. You get your home inspected. Are you living a right life? Do you speak English? If you don't speak English, you've got to come back to the plant and learn to speak English. If you don't, you don't get the $5 a day. And maybe we'll just get somebody else to do your job. So there's going to be a whole sense of kind of coercive uh, efforts to draw it in. 
And much of that is a very, one might argue it was noble in thought, its implementation gets very creepy. World War I will unleash, is a, is a critical issue, it will unleash a whole wave of anti-immigrant, anti-radicalism. You know, we're going to crush dissent. Eugene V. Debs, white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, socialist. They put him in the and put him in prison. Mennonites, men who men uh, religious uh, uh, dis, uh, dissenters who will not wear buttons on their clothes and fight their pacifists get put into, into, into the, uh, Fort Leavenworth, the uh, the prison, and there'll be there'll be a whole host of things. World War One is a real unleashing period, and it begins to take the tools of modernism and wield it in a much more effective force against different groups. And so this sort of idea, the sort of idealism of progressivism kind of peters out by the end of the passage of Prohibition, which is kind of the ultimate uh, anti-immigrant reform effort. But to that end, Ku Klux, the Ku Klux Klan does not come out of nowhere. Now, the most famous example we think of is Birth of a Nation, which comes from the author Thomas Dixon's novel, The Klansman. And it begins to tap into the idea of the lost cause, the romantization of the South. If you want a more popular example of that, it was just on television last night for a quick second. Gone with the Wind, the ultimate example of that. Mossy Oaks, the beautiful, tomorrow's another day. Of course, powerful cultural resonance, but that is directly in the midst of the lost cause. That's going to be for the South. That's going to tie in. So you're going to have a lot of this. You're going to have things that are, are going on. Here's, so think of it. We're going to fix society. We're going to make these people fit in. We don't know how, but we're going to do it. We have a sense of, uh, of dealing with these, of these groups that are other, African Americans, immigrants, Catholics. Ugh, what do we do with them? And also at the sense as well is that to where the, the rise of the Klan kind of taps into all the sorts of unsettledness. What does urbanization exactly mean? By the way, radio comes out and Americans like cars. They come about the same time. We're nuts for it. Technology, we, you know, everybody's got an iPod. You know, I, I'm staying up here and I drag around about 20 pounds of technology with me every day. In fact, if I didn't have PowerPoint, my students would go, what are you doing? Absolutely, we love this sort of stuff. And if you think about it, for a lot of these folks, this is very new. And they begin to use it effectively. One of the most effective tools, advertising. Mass market selling. And so the Klan fits right into that perfectly. And the 20s as well are going to, as we go into that, usually it's the image of the roaring 20s. Uh, maybe your professors have had you read, um, oh, uh, Frederick Allen White's, um, oh, I can't think of the name, but I'm pulling a, my, own, my own kind of gaffe on that one. Um, Only Yesterday, the wonderful uh, tale. Uh, that was written in 1931. So he's writing about the 20s from only two years after it actually was, was over with. And so he has a very skewed views, but that book shapes much of what we think about the 1920s. And for Alan, his sense is, hey, it was one good time, and oops, then there was a stock market crash and everything went downhill. Mm, wouldn't that be nice? So the Klan grows out of a lot of these sorts of things, and we've done something to it. We've either demonized it, we've mythologized it, and we've shoved it under the rug. Whenever I talk about this, people kind of sit there. Everybody sits up very straight in their chairs. It's all like, uh-oh, he's talking about something scary. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, that's something we've done. So why was it, the, like, to come back to my original point, why would you keep a uniform, the Klansman's uniform? The reason being is that it is such a powerful symbol. And it is something. This is, we talk about images. If you have that up there, it, it says what it is. And it becomes, uh, 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 my favorite word of the day is cipher. You can put on it whatever you would like. And it means lots of different things. And I'm going to try to offer you a couple different ways to think about this. Clan, the second clan is reformed in 1915 outside of Atlanta, Georgia. They burn, uh, there's a cross lighting or a cross burning. Remember, terminology and semantics do matter. If you support the Klan, you would not say it's a cross burning. That is sacrilegious. The Klan's official doctrine says it is a cross lighting. It was a call to arms. Uh, supposedly, who knows, is tied to Scottish clans that would light the, the cross to draw Christians to repel invaders. Who knows? 
I, my sense is, is it sounds really good. Again, you gotta sell it. Okay, because if you think about it logically, many of these things, if you think about in a cold light of day, you wear a cone-shaped hat. Uh, if you think about it, the usual form of what you think of as a cone-shaped hat is usually a dunce cap. Put the dunce cap on, face the corner because you're misbehaving or something like that. So again, if you tell somebody that, they're gonna go, okay. In addition, we're gonna get across, we're gonna light it up, we're gonna put it up there and we're gonna burn it. Uh-huh. Um, that doesn't exactly sound proper. If you think about it, and there's going to be a lot of reaction to that. There's going to be a sense of, sure, okay. But the Klan starts up in the South in 1915. It is uh, a, a wielded uh, kind of clunkily. It's also at a time in the teens and from the 1890s, a massive upsurge in violence against African Americans. This is going to be the very peak of lynchings in the United States. This is going to be a very terrible storm, partly because of these unsettled natures. And also, if we think about it, this is a period of when the first generation born after slavery, who come of age in the 1880s to the 19 teens, that these are young men and women who are uh, for African Americans who are just coming of age and are going to say, you know, wait a minute here. What happened to our rights? What is our citizenship? What if we do what Booker T. Washington says? Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Will the South, the new South, allow that? And the answer is no. Climb, but not too high. Achieve, but not too much. Dream, but not too big. Know your place. And there will be a coding of this. So the Klan exists within a very weird construct, a very scary construct when you really think about it. So the Klan kind of bumps along, and it's not really going to be until about 19, 1918 that Hiram Evans, who starts it up, an itinerant sometimes preacher and salesman, not a very good one, by the way, hires two advertising execs to come down and put some spark in the organization. And that's kind of where we pick up. As we know, the organization will take off. It will reach its apogee in Indiana. And it's going to be a huge kind of, uh, of, of rise uh, that's going to really come through. And it's going to sweep into Indiana. And my, my question always is, why Indiana? Because if you think about it, the Klan to exist in the South makes sense. The Klan to exist in the North that has a relatively small African-American population, but much more, many more immigrants, you know, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. The South, you can figure it out, right? You can deal with that. You know, there's going to be a different for the population demographic split. But that's part of the issue. So one of the things to, to think about here is how that goes on. So to move forward, um, the, the, the Klan uh, is going to become incorporated. That's one of the names of these things. So we'll have the Knights of Constitution Bylaws, the Ku Klan, Incorporated. The KKK, Inc. It sounds like a corporation, doesn't it? We're going to run it like a business. You're going to have a whole host of things, invisible palace, invisible empire. You're going to create this sort of thing. Uh, the 14-point program, the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, so this is, this is mirroring Woodrow Wilson's 14 points to end the war in World War I. And he puts forward kind of an interesting, whoop, I got a, went a little too far here. He puts forward a very interesting position. Uh, they put in here these 14 points. And the 14 points are very, very hard to see, but they're pretty critical. Uh, the first one says that you organize the majority group in America for the protection of our homes, our churches, our schools, and our system of government as guaranteed by our Constitution and Bill of Rights and all that good stuff. Free speech, free press, peaceful assemblage. Second one, foster the teachings of Jesus Christ in the economic, political, and social life of America. Third one is educate every child born in America to become a good American citizen, believing in the government of the United States. Fourth one is deport every alien now residing in the United States who came here illegally. Compulsory education of aliens residing in the country legally, and that's one of the legal ones, in the principles of Americanism. Uh, fifth one, uh, sixth one, sponsor legislation that will imprison any school teacher in America who teaches a subversive doctrine to any child in any school system in this country. What that subversive doctrine is, open for interpretation. Stop immigration in the United States until every American has a job and every person in the United States is Americanized. Deport every alien subversive agitator from the United States. The ninth one, outlaw every organization in the United States that it advocates the overthrow of our government by force. Uh, 
Tenth one is outlaw every organization in the U.S., agent of a foreign government. The eleventh one, I always thought this was very interesting, appropriations of enough money for arms to protect us against invasion, but not one dime for a foreign war. And twelfth one, a large enough army and navy for protection, but not one soldier or sailor for a foreign war. Uh, Thirteen, give American citizens all chance at all jobs. And on the fourteenth one, place only those persons in positions of public trust in our political, social, and economic life who are advocates of the American system, whether it be dog catcher or president of the United States, preacher or priest, president of a social club or master of a lodge, steward in a local union or international president of the same, sweeper in a factory or executive manager of the plant. And this one should be put only Americans on guard. This is going to be a, both a reaction to the real disillusionment that many citizens feel with the United States' involvement in the First World War. You know, a lot of folks had a sense that we went, we fought, and what did we get out of it? Not much. The Europeans are still duking it out over land, and we didn't really want to be there. In addition, there will be a real sense that this is also part of a super patriotism. First World War, you really got to whip that up. Because remember, when the, when, the, when the United States votes for war in April 1917, it's a split vote. It isn't like World War II. There's no Pearl Harbor. World War I, the sense the Committee on Pub, for Public Information, George Creel, the Creel Commission, really just sells it like crazy. And it kind of unleashes a little too much. You will have, this is also an era of riots. Uh, there will be riots in Chicago, the red summer of 1919. There will be uh, terrible riots in East St. Louis, Missouri, in Harlem, in Washington, D.C. And really one of the worst, is, and it's, uh, it's actually fostered the only Truth and Reconciliation Commission in the United States, kind of like South Africa, was in Tulsa, 1921. And that's going to be a very, very frightening entity. So this is going to be part of it, and this grows out of that. If you notice, it really isn't geared against one group. It says alien. However you define that, however you define a lot of these things. So it's going to play around with this sort of thing very carefully, very cleverly. So the Klan is an oddball sort of entity when you really think about it. It does a lot of different things. You can see the Klan. It, it draws in men and women. Uh, women will be in a subordinate role. It also practices gender segregation, gender hierarchy. It's going to do all those sorts of things. So you're going to have, it's going to be involved in parades that you will have initiations, and of course you will have the flag. That's one of the critical components. The flag is always there. Hyper-patriotism, the sense that what you're doing is noble and just. Initiation will do that. Uh, in addition, that will change, you will have parades. I don't know what city this is. Uh, what's really interesting, if you ever go to photograph swap meets, you can certainly find very interesting images, all sorts of stuff. Um, so you'll, have, you'll be marching through. Through cities as a public demonstration. You will have far gatherings. You know, aircraft are fairly new, so, the, so you'll have folks will join up there. You'll go out to a field, you'll have a kind of, it's almost like Protestant revivalism. You'll be able to have sorts of these sorts of religious meetings and, and ideas. And these are photos that are frankly, folks, that's a postcard actually. They're, they're hidden in plain sight. They're not hidden in a dark corner. It's not necessarily something that didn't happen. It's part of American cultural life. People show up. They're in a parade. It offers you kind of membership. It gives you a sense of place within a topsy-turvy world. Now, this is a really interesting image. This is, this is right over by Indiana Street and Bridge Street in July 4th, 1925. Uh, 16,000 people will come to Grand Rapids, and they will see a, a Klan parade and rally. They come from uh, the, uh, very different states and across the, uh, the Midwest to promote their beliefs. And so well, they'll, have a, they'll be camped out at Lincoln Park on Bridge Street, which, if, for those of you who know Grand Rapids, that's right in the middle of the formerly Polish and Lithuanian piece of the city. So here's what you do. You take the Klan, Protestant, anti-immigrant, and you're going to camp out in the middle of, of the basically hostile territory. That's going to be pretty provocative. Um, what they're going to do is they're going to form a marching band, gather their floats, and are ready to parade. Uh, about a third of them were women. So for about 3,000 marchers, the third of them will be women, over 1,000 women. That's pretty different. In addition, they'll march down, uh, down Bridge Street. They'll proceed to Ottawa, south to Fulton, 
then west to John Ball Park and with a police escort, uh, they will march uh, past uh, these uh, lots of folks uh, watching and then they will go to hear a, a political rally in uh, John Ball Park. It's going to be all tied up in that. Uh, these are, there's only, I found so far, there are only three images of the march in Grand Rapids. There will be a total of seven newspaper articles, all of them less than a, a third of a column. They will not talk about it in Grand Rapids. That's a very, very interesting set of events. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Now, it was also, in 1925, it's also going to be a summer of tension over in Detroit. Detroit has grown since 1910 from being about 300,000 people to about a million and a half. It's going to be an explosive growth as the auto industry takes off. And what that, it's going to be a political circus. The mayor in 1924 resigns for health reasons, and it opens up an off-year election at the height of the Klan's uh, power in the United States. And so what will happen is uh, they'll have their man, the Klan will run a man, Charles Bowles. And Bowles will run as a writing candidate. And he'll be asked, why don't you disavow your association with the Klan? And he says, well, they haven't said anything bad about me. I'm not going to say anything bad about them. We want to play that sort of line. Uh, what will happen is that there will be a real concern towards uh, the, uh, the, the large and growing African-American community. Uh, most, uh, most explosively, there were African-Americans who had left the traditional Hastings Street, right where I-375 is, where you, if you walk out and stand on Ford Field, you are standing in the heart of the traditional African-American neighborhood. So that's going to be the, the area there that we've kind of, we've kind of, again, we've kind of carefully obliterated. That's part of our cultural heritage as well, what we do there. Uh, there will be cross burnings, massive rallies. Uh, the Jesuit University, my alma mater, the University of Detroit, moves from downtown Detroit to northwest Detroit, out at the corner of uh, Six Mile and Livernois. And the Klan will march across, and there's wonderful images of the Father McNichols. With his, he gets the youngest uh, Jesuits, the big strapping guys, and uh, McNichols account, uh, recounts in his memoir that he stood out there, and as a command of the cloth, he also had a pistol of man in his pocket ready to do or die for the new parish they were building. So that makes for interesting things. Uh, it's going to be very tense. Uh, it's going to, all it takes is a spark. In addition, an African-American doctor in September, a little later in the summer, Dr. Ocean Sweet will move into a house at the car corner of Garland and Charlevoix on the east, lower east side of Detroit in the white neighborhood. His house will be attacked by a mob, and Dr. Sweet will f defend his home. With his, uh, with his family and friends uh, with firearms. One man will be killed, one of the mob will be killed, another will be wounded, and it will set off a very celebrated trial in U.S. legal circles. Uh, there's a book that just came out on it called Ark of Justice by Kevin Boyle. But it's going to really, but Detroit, bizarrely enough, and it's, no one talks about this, and I tweak Boyle's tale, he doesn't talk about it. Detroit is the only major city in the 1920s that doesn't have a, a massive race riot. And I'm not quite sure why. It's very interesting. I have my own theory, but we'll do that. So, if we go here, uh, these are images are really nice, that they're really close, and that's really good. This is the other, this is my real find. You're one of the first groups to see me show this. This is, the, this is if you know where that little train platform is, a bridge, right over by the little, uh, little fast food restaurant, some photographer climbed the top and took a picture of the Klan marchers as they go by. And there's downtown. Uh, at the top there, that's the Grand Rapids Brewery Company. This is Bridge Street. 3,000 marchers. The other photos, the other two photos are really, are really good because they're up close. Check that out. That tells you the size of it. This isn't just like some little thing. It isn't a two-car parade. That's pretty, pretty creepy. Gives you a sense of the, of the size of that. Now, for most of us, maybe it's not shocking. For me, I was very thrilled to find this. And it's only a little photograph, too. It's off of a postcard. So it's quite unique to see that. Now, in, two, in 2008, I mean, most of us don't even know that there was more than one clan. That's what I think about it. So this, is my, this is my boring academic component here, so I'm sorry. I'm, we'll get back to the exciting stuff here in a second. But what happens is that what you do is you, the, the most notable clan has a strength uh, in the 1920s. Most of the clan membership for the second clan is above the Mason-Dixon line. In the South, that's going to exist for its own sake, but the, the organize, organized part is going to be to the North. Uh, you're going to have uh, basically uh, the creation of this sort of, of new clan. Uh, December 4th, 1915 is the exact date. And what you do is that you're, you're going to, one observer 
uh, views this in 1924 as it has made a tremendous recent growth and can no longer be considered a gang of hoodlums and criminals or simply a mob. It is respectable, largely composed of very decent, well-meaning, and well-behaved people of the kind who are the backbone of the nation, end quote. And another one says, another observer at the time said, it seemed like an echo from the religious struggle of the past. One religion, one race, one color. Taking hold of the minds and imaginations of the people. It gripped the worker with his dinner pail and the pastor in his pulpit. So that's a very seductive. And remember, super patriotism, religion, it all gets merged together. And that's something that I think for a lot, of, especially in West Michigan, we don't really like thinking about to where you would have that sort of uh, effective wielding of that sort of two things together. However, the clan, the second clan is really different than the first one in that basically most of its membership lives in the city, not in the countryside. So this isn't a bunch of, you know, uh, of, uh, of rural folk kind of doing this. And it's going to be very, and the second clan is very different than the one that's going to battle a civil rights movement in the 1960s. That one is going to look a lot more like the first one decentralized, kind of sporadic, no central leadership. The second clan does have this sort of power. And what it will do is, my startup disk is almost full. Why, thanks. I'm glad it's here to tell me this. All right, hang on a second here. We are currently experiencing technical difficulties. Well, all right, there we go. Um, so it's going to be very different than that one. Uh, with some communities, uh, violence was, is likely wielded against the Klan, then buy it. Klan is racist, nativist, prohibitionist, because if you ban alcohol, you're against immigrants as well. Immigrants who might, uh, like the Germans, like to drink on the Sabbath. Not exactly acceptable. Uh, and anti-Semitic and anti-Catholic, and, and its worldview is not going to be consistent and coherent. It may, be, it may have been a united organization, but it was uh, really not adopted different issues and tactics in different places. The Klan is not a monolith. The second one is not a monolith. That's a hard thing for us to think about. And it's a, fundamentally, it's a modern movement. That's the thing. It's, it's anti-modern, but it is modern. It's a weird little amalgamation. You can say, what does that mean? Well, what does it mean is that it was inspired by a movie, Birth of a Nation. It uses, it was advanced through advertising. Remember, when you buy the Klan, that little pamphlet, that little booklet I show you, they have catalogs where you buy your regalia. Do you want to buy the extra special costume for $15.99? Or do you want to buy it for $17? It has the extra red piping. It's like you go, it uses as you would buy it in a clothing store. It will have techniques that will be employed by corporate sale folks. So the, the two folks, the two New Yorkers, Edward Clark and Elizabeth Tyler, developed a marketing strategy. Strategy: uh, Skilled organizers in the field could make a living selling memberships. They would make money and then they would give money back. Uh, to further profits, they held the rights to sell clan merchandise, uniforms, and that would make sure for revenues. Uh, Kleagles, ordinary salesmen, uh, kept $4 from every $10 membership fee they sold, and they demanded weekly reports, sales forecasts, and local marketing plans. It looks like you're selling memberships for any sort of organization. Uh, it's, gonna, it's, it's hard to say. It has been in between 1.5 and 5 million members. Why? Because really, folks, this is an organization that as a whole today is not like the Rotarians. It's not like uh, the Better Business Bureau. They don't keep records. Most of those records, I can tell you exactly where they went, right to the garbage can. Just like the regalia. When the 60s comes along and you open it up and you find the trunk, I can tell you where I have a, a neighbor who found one in their house. And they said, yeah, we took it in the backyard and we burned it because it has that such a taint. And if you find those things, it's pretty rare. So it's very difficult to do accurate numbers. It's like uh, somebody said, well, how many people belonged? Good luck. It's a guess. You know? After that time, you didn't have a button that said, yeah, I belong to the Klan. Harry Truman thought about joining the Klan, future president. And his, uh, his pa political patron in Kansas City said, no. You don't want to do that because you'll never get the stain off. And years later, he said, yeah, you know, I thought about it. Just for political power, he goes, but glad I didn't. And so it's, it's certainly there. Now, in addition, the Klan will control the governments of Indiana, Oregon, and Colorado. It will elect other politicians and play a major role in the Democratic Convention in 1924. So it's a really powerful entity. So that's going to be a really interesting kind of idea. And the early scholars who are going to look at this in the 
20s, 30s, and 40s are going to say that it is uh, it's the secret society is overwhelmingly rural, fundamentalist, and driven by, as, as one sociologist wrote, by the, quote, petty impotence of the small town mind. That's a wonderful thing. So if you're from a small town, that was the idea. They could kind of take a smack. It's, oh, small towners will do that. Now, there's going to be a couple waves of scholarship that's really going to take that apart, that, we've, that historians, we've really started to kind of take it apart and look for those records. Where do they exist so we can understand and figure out, why would you join this thing? So the first comes in the 60s, and the clan that came out there was that it was an urban, national, and largely convinced with enforcing an authoritarian moral order. Protestant, overwhelmingly. Race may have been paramount in parts of the South, but in Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Oklahoma, the Klan's activity, these folks find, indicate a strikingly small amount of hostility to African Americans. That why? That was taken as a given. That wasn't anything new. They were already doing that. They didn't need to have a new organization to carry out that sort of domestic terrorism. They're going to be fighting against things such as premarital chastity, marital fidelity, respect for parental authority, and to compel obedience of state and national prohibition laws, to fight the post-war crime wave, and to rid state and local governments of dishonest politicians. They've got a different agenda. And so these clans were more likely to flog victims for bootlegging or breaking marriage vows than for being black or Jewish. Doesn't mean that they didn't do it, just meant that in other parts of the, of the, of the, of the United States they did that. The second wave of the scholarship has been ongoing since about the mid-70s, and social historians have poured through census data, newly uncovered records of individual claverns, uh, in the, and the result is that it's a, a detailed series of, act, of studies of activities, ideologies, and social, social classes uh, in cities ranging from Buffalo to Anaheim. And so there's going to be some really interesting work that comes out of there. Uh, most notably, it's going to be Leonard Moore and Sean Lay. And they're going to call it the civic activist model of the Klan. And what they argue is that the Klan serves different purposes in different communities. But in general, it represented mainstream social and political concerns, not those of a disaffected fringe group. So if you think of the Klan in the 20s as a bunch of yahoos who are ticked off and going to get liquored up and go brawl, that would be totally wrong. These are people who wear shirts and ties, who belong to the Rotarians, who go to, to uh, you know, the Chamber of Commerce. They're going to be much scarier. It's going to be people who you would think would be sober and would be the better group of society. And what they're going to find as well is that each study found, finds that the, the Klan focused a good deal of energy on community business elites who stood in the way of popular social and political reforms. Uh, Lay does a, Sean Lay does a really good study of El Paso, and he says that basically uh, the Klan, if, the, if, the, if in fact the Klan was composed largely of unrestrained racists, bigots, and moral authorita authoritarians, that El Paso would have been one of the most likely places for the order to engage in roughshod, bare knuckles taxi, uh, tactics. And he goes, but actually, he goes, no, didn't do that at all. He said they ignored the Hispanic majority, never employed violence, and spent most of its time challenging the policies of fellow Anglos who dominated civic governments, focusing on issues such as better public education, honest elections, and road construction. He says, so basically, the Klan in El Paso looked a lot like the other reform groups, which, again, flies directly in the face of our kind of the, the image of the uh, birth of a nation, you know, fiery crosses and all that. Now the, now, the key word is restrain, unrestrained. Lay doesn't state that the Klan wasn't racist, but as he put in his study of the Klan in Buffalo, he does two of these, the intolerance that characterized the Klan pervaded all levels of white society in the 1920s. In much of the country, it attempted to advance its, its ends not through covert violence, but through the organized legal violence of the state. They don't need to beat you up in the street. They will simply take away voting rights. They will restrict your ability to go to the poll. Poll taxes will rise. They will do something that is much more subtle. It has a smiling, bland face. It's institutionalized. I didn't do it to you personally. That's just how the laws are. It's a much sneakier way to do that. In Oregon and Michigan, for example, attempted to outlaw parochial schools. Mid-1920s will be a huge battle. Can you have parochial schools? And by parochial, read Catholic schools. But, Luth but if you write the laws... Lutherans are in there, too, and the Lutherans get a little upset about that. Their response is, uh, no, you're not doing that to us. So there's going to be a fight. Now, it would be more uh, accurate to say it's uh, basically what, what uh, the problem with the, uh, the civic activist is that what another historian, Glenn Feldman, has complained. He says that the 20s Klan 
is currently portrayed by some scholars as an almost an innocuous garden variety style civic and th philanthropic agency. And so there's been some real kind of beefs about that. And I have to kind of agree with him. It's almost as though you're trying to repair a reputation. It kind of skids a little too close to that. And so they've kind of gone against it. And it's one of those interesting ideas. And one of the things that I would argue to you is that we have two, we've kind of staked out two very different positions. One is the fiery cross, the wild-eyed, you know, fringe element, lunatics. The other side is, well, they were tithe, they worked in business, and they were just ordinary, everyday people. And we, we didn't do this sort of stuff. Somewhere, and Feldman argues, it's got to be somewhere in the middle. And that's the harder spot because it doesn't mean that the, that the issues are so clear and crisp. That's the real problem. So what you have is uh, Nancy McLean puts forward a new, another new work, and she argues that it's uh, – that she tries to generalize the George's experience to describe the entire national organization. And that doesn't work out so good. But she offers the best summations of the second clan. She, uh, she writes that it, the clan of the 20s was at once mainstream and extreme, hostile to big government – and also uh, uh, antagonistic to labor unions, anti-elitist and hateful of, of blacks of Im and immigrants, pro-law and order, but prone to extra-legal violence. If scholars have viewed these attributes as incompatible, Klansmen themselves did not. And I think that's pretty good. You have within these organizations wildly extreme ideas, and it's a mess within there. So what goes under that? So the Klan will eventually peter out under a lot of weight and uh, the like. So it's going to have a lot of problems in there. And this is going to be part of progressivism and this sort of this sort of experience that's going to go on. Uh, you will have banners and the like uh, that will go forward. Uh, this is from Detroit. Uh, when we think about this, the Klan comes to Detroit and in the early 1920s, and it's going to really try to take control of the political uh, kind of structure of the city. Uh, you'll have two candidates in 1924 uh, and 25. John Smith, an East Side Catholic. He was, his name was actually Johann Karasowitz. So he changed his name to Smith because that's going to be a little bit more acceptable. And in Detroit, uh, jo Joseph Smith, a West Side Protestant businessman, they're going to do that. And then Charles Bowles, a Protestant, U of M trained lawyer, Fairly new to the city, enters the campaign to take him for, for the city's highest office. And it's going to be a real vicious campaign. There will be, for, for Charles Bowles, rumors will swirl about his possible involvement with the Klan. Uh, the, basically, there's going to be a huge organizational uh, restructuring. The Klan public, uh, publication, the Fiery Cross, will be sold on street corners. But the police department is heavily Irish Catholic, and they beat up the vendors. And so the Klan goes and gets a court injunction. Please don't beat up our vendors. They beat up the, 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 the deliverer of the message. They beat him up. So it's going to be this huge mess that swirls within the city. Uh, so it's going to be a real mess. And the Detroit News and the media, interesting enough, in the city of Detroit, doesn't take a favorable view. The news, the free press, the Detroit Saturday Night, and the Detroit Tribune, there were four newspapers at one time, says that the Klan boasts no saving grace. No man operating a mask, behind a mask ever intended to affect any purpose save the violation of the law. So they're going to take it as they don't care. They don't care what they say. If you wear a mask, you're not, you're not part of our deal. But it will also still draw, and this is Wayne County, there will be rallies all throughout this time period. And it's going to look very much like a social organization in its own way. This will take a second here to change. Uh, these are out of a scrapbook I picked up. You don't find a lot of these images kind of composed and portraitized. You're going to find them in the back corners of people's attics and in their back rooms. And they're going to be kind of a subtle thing. This is probably the wackiest one, and I have an interesting story. Uh, if you notice, uh, this is the clan, and they have a, his dog is in a costume as well. So it looks a lot like you would have any sort of social parade. And so we look at it, and we're going, you know, everybody's eyebrows. I can look out at you, and all your eyebrows went, okay, dog's in a... Yeah, mm. but that's right. But if you think about this, this is part of the idea. You put a clan, you put a rally together, you put together a picnic. It's a social organization. It's going to the Elks or the Moose. Uh, the, this right here is it's it really spells out Brightmoor, and Brightmoor is a new neighborhood in the city of Detroit in 19 uh, early 1920s, and Brightmoor is composed heavily of white migrants, both from the south and from the copper mines of the Upper Peninsula. 
The houses are very small and put together. The, the uh, builder of it says an advertisement that says that 11,319 English-speaking people live here. Code word. Native-born Anglos live in this neighborhood. Don't you want to come out here? It will not have... It won't have running water. It won't even have electricity. It hasn't even been annexed yet by the city in 1925. But the idea being that it's a new place to live. You don't have to live in the crowded central city. So in Chicago, if race riots explode, if the sweet, Dr. Sweet will be pulled into this, if he moves into a white neighborhood, the sense was we don't have to fight to preserve our neighborhood. We'll just move away. We'll go to the outlying areas. And so that's really what Detroit does. That's why it doesn't have a riot. Now, what will happen is that the Klan in Detroit will really struggle to try to really kind of con con control this sort of idea. And, you know, frankly, he says, he says in one campaign speech, I can only say that I am not a Klansman. And if I have the support of the organization, I do not know anything about it. I was asked to denounce the Klan, and I did not believe in those tactics. I had no cause to attack the Klan. They didn't attack me. I'm not going to attack them. So it's going to be a very sort of uh, 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 really kind of a tense idea. The night before the, the morning of the primary, uh, justified fears were justified when a 10-foot cross erected by two white-robed men blazed in front of City Hall in Detroit while police officers watched. A 12-foot sheet of canvas lit by flames listed the names of the candidates for office with the words KKK, our slate, vote for these, printed at the top. So certainly they are afoot. And so there's going to be a whole host of this real struggle that's going to go on. Now, what happens? Why do they, they lose? What happens is that John Smith, the East Side Polish Catholic, does something fairly unprecedented. He reaches out to the African-American community. He reaches out to the Jewish community. And he begins to actively campaign on that sort of unified idea. And he tries to pull these together, which is really an interesting sort of idea. That deals with that. And so for 1925, he manages to succeed. They unite. They vote against uh, uh, Bowles. Bowles loses. So there's going to be kind of, this, it's kind of this idea. And many of the newspapers go, well, isn't that nice? All these sorts of people got together and voted against Bowles and the like. But, there's going, but he's only in office for a year. Klan's going to try again. And Smith, especially after the sweet shootings, kind of begins to really turn against African Americans. And he says, I must say that I deprecate most strongly the moving of Negroes or other persons into districts in which they knew their presence may cause riot or bloodshed. I believe that any colored person who endangers life and property simply to gratify his personal pride is the enemy of his race, as well as an incitement of riot and murder. These men who have permitted themselves to be tools of the KKK in its efforts to flam the flames of racial hatred and murderous fire have hurt the cause of their race in a degree that cannot be uh, measured. And in addition, Henry Ford, who didn't like Detroit and was not necessarily considered uh, the most progressive of men, uh, actually joined the election and said, you know what, I support John Smith. So that threw the city's Jewish community into an interesting position. Ford, that, at that very moment, was reprinting the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Uh, the supposed uh, a document that uh, asserted why Jews were going to take over the world. Uh, these are, this is a community. They have a plan. They're going to take over the world, even though we don't treat them very well, but they're going to take over the world. So it's going to be this terrible idea, and so they're going to be stuck in this position. Now, Smith wins, but it's really going to reveal the fractures inside Detroit. And by the time the next election, electoral campaign comes up, the, the Klan will, will weaken. But interestingly, in 1930, Bowles will become mayor. He'll be recalled in the summer of 1931. And that's going to be a whole other story. I could do a whole other project on that. But it's going to be very interesting how these guys come back. Now, in Grand Rapids, the, when the Klan comes here, Arthur Vandenberg, uh, who a uh, future senator, uh, owner of the Grand Rapids Herald, the publisher, vehemently proclaimed his opposition to the Klan through a series of editorials condemning rumored violence and the tactics of the Klan. Um, the Grand Rapids press didn't say much. But that's kind of interesting. They didn't really say much about it one way or the other. You'll have a whole series of anti-parochial school bills in the 1920s. You will also have a very, very big um, uh, movement uh, with Protestant parochial schools to really push back against the anti-parochial school movement because their sense is, wait a minute, this is against us too because 
that's part of the uh, the the 100% the Americanism sort of idea. So that's also going to be a great struggle. And what happens is that you're going to have another problem. In Grand Rapids, the CRC and the RCA, the Christian Reformed Church and the Reformed Church of America, do not look very favorably upon the Klan. Uh, there is a few documents I found that indicate that their sense is that the Klan is a challenge to their religious and moral authority within their community. And they did not truck that sort of challenge lightly. The Catholic Church, which was at that point kind of uh, not as strong as them, kind of smilingly kind of moved over next to them and kind of said, we're with you. And so you have a real interesting idea. Potential Klan members and good Christians and good members of these two dominant religious communities are in a position. Do you join and flaunt the religious authority or do you stay out? That's going to be real tough. There's also going to be another problem. Um, there's going to be uh, Vivian and, and Nicholas Souter are going to be two organizers that come to Grand Rapids in the mid-1920s. And they're going to be, uh, have a contract. They're going to be working to organize these folks. And unfortunately, though, there's going to be a lot of unhappiness. And in early 1925, they discover that, they've not, that, these, that the Souters discover they weren't going to be paid. So they file a lawsuit. So here's an interesting experience. The Klan will file a lawsuit against that. If you know where the Federal Square building is, just down uh, Pearl Street, that was their headquarters. And they filed a lawsuit. They, they retrieved documents from their headquarters, and they brought them to the court. And so if you go to the court file, you can find all the documents from the Klan. That's how you find this stuff, folks. You find it in the most weird places. But there they are. And it lays it out. It says, basically, they revealed names they claimed were key figures in the growth of the Grand Rapids Klan. And then they, they basically argued that what was going on was that it was going to be, uh, they were embezzling money and that there was troubling. Initial fact finding found that they only had about 5,000 members in an area, a metropolitan area of that point of 150,000 people. That's pretty small. In Evansville, Indiana, they had close to 50,000 members that were documented. Evansville is one of those places that actually kept all their stuff. And so there's going to be a huge rage uh, against them. And what happens is, is that there's, there's, really, there's really very little membership in Grand Rapids. The, the Klan had, had thought that Grand Rapids would be the perfect place. Protestant, moralistic. They had voted to support prohibition overwhelmingly. Michigan goes dry in 1916 four years before national prohibition becomes law. So it's really, it's why they're not there in Grand Rapids and not Detroit. Uh, and so to prepare, so the, what the Klan does is they, the Detroit chapter says, fine, what we're going to do is we're going to try to whip up a kind of an old time political religious fervor in Grand Rapids. And so to prepare for the weekend, July 4th, 1925 festivities, the Klan sent a preparatory crew. Uh, they got a tent city for out of towners to gather and eat under in case of inclement weather. They rented Lincoln Park. Uh, but their campground was probably along the Bridge Street Hill, as the hillsides are frequently remembered in, few, uh, in a few of the documents, and there's only seven newspaper articles. And so they stockpiled 8,000 cases of soft drinks, 30 tons of hamburgers, 45,000 buns, 2 tons of coffee, and 1,200 gallons of ice cream. And they also brought in a portable water supply system. Uh, I did just find this the other day. Uh, the Catholic Vigil mentions that uh, on the, the July 3rd, the night before the big march, uh, two crosses were burned, one on Lookout Hill, which is where the mural is today, and the other was burned on the, on, uh, where, uh, uh, on the Bridge Street Hill, uh, which had not yet had the houses built on it yet. The hill section develops later. They set them both on fire, so you have mirrored crosses from each other that are burning, kind of giving signal to the city that the Klan is here. Now, what's interesting is that when the marchers march through the city, and let me go back here to my image, when the marchers march through Grand Rapids, they're going to march, oh, rainbow wheel of death. Um, what they're going to do is they're going to march maskless, which is really remarkable. Uh, that doesn't normally happen. You're only going to do that in certain specific times. And they march through. Because what it does is it diffuses the secrecy behind the organization's membership and linked it to open membership policies. Uh, one of the big things is that what you want to do is Michigan passes a law that says you cannot gather while wearing a mask. It's still in the books, by the way. So it's partly a way to diffuse secrecy and also not get arrested because the great question was, is did you want to really flaunt that too much? So that's a really a critical idea. 
And so there's going to be the American Crusaders, the Junior Order of the Klan, Women of the Klan, and the Ladies Quartet of Owasso, Owasso in Shiawassee County, will, uh, just to, between Flint and uh, 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 Lansing. It's going to be a very powerful uh, move, uh, 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 location for that. And the Grand Rapids Papers, at the days after, only ran four articles. Four of the seven articles will come after July, 24, uh, July 4th. On the 6th, the Herald and the Press ran two articles that appear almost identical. Pieces simply say the rallies and parades took place, the number of marchers, and then expected 16,000 attended, which they never confirmed. Who knows how many people really showed up. They knew, you can tell the marchers. There's a lot of marchers. But as far as how many people showed up, the papers never identified. They're very good about that. When, the, when there's a county fair and the circus, they'll actually have people counting so they give them a precise number. But not for this. That's kind of strange. And in addition, no editorials appear the week. What appear would be, at first, to be a significant gathering, looks on the surface like another merely, another mildly interesting news item of a bygone era buried always on page two, three, four, and five. They don't put it on the front page. There's none of that sort of stuff. A telling remark in the press was the notice that quantities of foodstuffs remaining at the camp on Monday were free to those who came by to retrieve them. So unlike Detroit, that has an experience to where there's an active effort to take control of the city's uh, uh, political power, to really whip up really huge memberships in a time that is extraordinarily tense in the city. Grand Rapids doesn't have that at all. Grand Rapids just kind of has this kind of an interesting experience, but doesn't really catch traction. The plan will not come back to Grand Rapids. It will actually move to its headquarters to Jackson. And it will stay there until it kind of devolves out of, uh, out of that. So it's really a very interesting uh, experience. And you could view you know, Grand Rapids as being kind of anticlimactic. Instead of a powerful, unified organization in control of civility governance and working through community institutions, it rose into sight and faded from view. And it seemingly left a few marks on the communities that it appears in. Uh, and the memories of participants, we've kind of grown selective. We don't talk much about it. So what did it mean? So you look at me going, well, well, what does this all mean then? And so this is weird organization. They're nuts. There's a mess. What can we understand? Well, for Grand Rapids, it kind of, uh, it looks, uh, the, the city had had a very interesting struggle during the teens, during World War I. Uh, also during uh, the sort of labor strife, the 1911 furniture strike, there's going to be a lot of this sort of reorganizing of the social hierarchy in the city. It also has a very powerful religious community. And at this point in time, they're able to really reach out and impose a certain... They already, they already hold Trump when it comes to the social hierarchy of, of moral authority. The CRC and the RCA, they hold Trump. They don't need any Johnny-come-lately out, out, outside group to come in and say, ooh, ooh, we'll get you worked up. Well, they do that every week already. They don't need it. Secondly, um, it's... Probably not. It, it, it's, it's interesting. It inoculates it against the storms of the 20s. And though not probably not a warm sense of community and brotherhood between Catholics and African Americans and Dutch Protestants, uh, the city's leadership realized how potentially unstable their control of city institutions might prove. And, and indeed, the stress of the Depression just, you know, just five years later would touch off another round of labor and political strife. So the city's leadership, the city's com religious community, they weren't that certain of their ability to control things. So rather, the city's community and institutional leaders worked to suppress and muffle the potentially seductive siren song of the Klan. Again, not because they woke up one day and wanted to sing Kumbaya and hold hands. The sense was, is, do you really want something to touch off that could just completely spin out of control? Folks had realized that Chicago, Tulsa, uh, you know, Harlem, they didn't want that. They also didn't want extra legal violence. You know, that's one of those weird times to when we think of it as, you know, the kind of the bland Midwestern, we're all, mid, we're all Michigan nice, we all smile and all pleasant, to where it actually serves a, a pretty good purpose, to where they don't really kind of wander off. Detroit's experience pulled together a very unlikely coalition of African Americans, immigrants, uh, Catholics, and reformers against the Klan. And the Klan ignored conventional civic activists. So Sean Lane, Leonard Moore, the historiography I mentioned to you, the Klan in Detroit kind of thumbs its nose at it. And they, they lead an insurgent campaign. They decide to break all the rules to try to get power. And in 1925, that showed how fragile the, the coalition that, that Smith had formed in 1924, and it really kind of split apart. And so, driven between two potentially undesirable options, uh, most folks selected the lesser of two evils. They picked 
Smith over Bowles. So that's going to be a very interesting sort of idea that's going to experience through that. So in the end, the two cities are both emblematic of the New Scholarship's vision of the Klan. Uh, on one hand, you have one that is willing to do something insurgent, something with more violence, something more disruptive. But in Grand Rapids, you have one that looks much more civic activist, that appeals to good governance, that appeals to moral reform. Now, the last component, and one of the things that's the hardest to find, is that the Klan does exist outside of Detroit and Grand Rapids. And the next wave of work that needs to be done, and there's only a couple articles that exist, the Klan in, had a really powerful base in Macosta County, with Big Rapids up by Ferris State. And you could sit there and think, well, it really makes sense. If you have a newer way of looking at it, the New Scholarship's view of this kind of multi-layered Klan, it makes sense. Is it anti-African American? Uh, Macosta County in the 1920 census listed 27 African Americans. So it's not an anti-African American organization. In fact, the newspapers up there cover it very extensively and really mentioned that that wasn't the issue. They were angry at the Catholic farmers near Big Rapids. They were also angry about the scandalous new jazz music coming out of New York. They are also angry about kissing parties in cars. Because remember, the automobile takes sex from the front porch, chaperoned by family members, and puts it in a car, takes it away. Uh, the Big Rapids newspaper calls, it a ro calls the car a rolling brothel. And so it's kind of creepy. It's the new idea. And also they're very angry about young women showing their elbows. There's a whole article that talks about the frock as the sleeve goes up. Pretty scandalous stuff. So for rural areas, it's less about that. It's much more about different sorts of components. It's going to be about modernity, and it's going to throw in there anti-Catholicism, anti-African Americans, all the whole rest of it. But it, what order they put that in depends on community. So when we think about the Klan, it's critical that we think about it in its most complex and difficult aspects. That's a better way to think about it, and that's my favorite word of the, of the semester, which is to parse those details. Parsing it out helps us understand it much better. Thank you. Get this warmed up here. Um, Dr. Daly has agreed to take some questions. If anybody has a question, I'd like to bring the microphone around so um, folks at home that are watching this in the future can hear the question as well. So if you have a question, he would entertain those now. Hi. Hello. Thank you for the presentation. Fantastic stuff. Uh, I have a question about the 20s and the Klan and modernity. And it seems as though, um, in a way, the Klan was right for the times in the 1920s. And if that's true, and I'm not, please comment on whether or not you think it is, um, what happened? You know, why, why did it rise and fall? Um, the, the stuff I've read indicates that nationwide there were millions of members, especially if you folded the women's auxiliaries. Where did it go? Um, what do you think? Yeah, part of what, what causes the Klan to fail is that with, for all of its sophistication, for all of its kind of using media and all those sorts of ideas, it is not necessarily a terribly cohesive entity. One of the problems is that if you look at Indiana, Indiana is really kind of the, em the emblem of it. What happens is that if, if you have an organization that sets the sort of moral bar, yay high, you're going to get people who are not necessarily going to always adhere to that. Uh, D.C. Stephenson, who is the head of the Klan in Indiana, uh, gets himself into some trouble. He ends up killing his secretary. Yeah, he assaults her, bites her, beats her, and then she dies. And, but not without you know, whispering in a, in a deathbed confession, Stevenson did it. Well, that's going to basically smash the Klan to where millions of members go, okay, we belong to an organization that countenances this. And then all sorts of other interesting sorts of problems that Stevenson had come pouring out. People are mad. In addition, you'll have a rivalry within the national Klan. Uh, Hiram Evans, the second uh, Klan uh, president, and William Simmons, who's the original founder, basically begin to rip the organization in half as they struggle for control. They want to have power. No, no, pick me, I'm the leader. And they're going to have that sort of devolution. In addition, 1924 has the passage of, that, uh, of, 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 the, of the bills and the series of laws that effectively closes the golden door of immigration. 
that sort of hysteria that, oh no, they're coming for us, it slams it shut. And that's a critical component. Because then suddenly, your key issue is done. Uh, it ties in as well with prohibition. If you think about it, prohibition, when it's passed, today we look at it as this quaint and kind of weird thing. Why we ban booze? Really, who's going to do that? It, you know, we, we have a war on drugs. How's that going for us? Hmm, absolutely. You know, certainly that's a great struggle. But remember, we passed the prohibition laws and the dry forces, the anti-saloon league, the women's Christian temperance union, they close up shop, they go home. The wets, the people that support alcohol, they don't go home. They bide their time. And they go, see, you've got gangsters, and it's awful. And so people still drink, you know, it doesn't work. Everybody's doing it. Same for the Klan. The sense is, is that once you pass these laws and you take away the anger point, the sense is, is you go, huh. But, you know, we don't really have any immigrants near us. And as far as African Americans go, well, we'll, you know, for, especially for Southerners, their sense is we know how to put we know how to put them in their place already. We didn't need the Klan to teach us that. We already did that. We just had everything else added on top. In addition, there's going to be a real tension that will go on about modernity, that will go on, and people have a problem. We really like those radios. We really like the car. And even though it's scandal and okay, we'll live with it. It's kind of like the, the computer. I work with lots of folks. I'm, I'm completely a tech head when it comes to teaching my classes. I have websites and all this jazz. And I have a colleague who said, oh, I just write on the board. If it was chalk, I'd have chalk. And my sense is, too, I said, but you like, you like the onion, you know, the Internet, and reading your newspapers online. Yeah, I guess. And I said, yeah, guess what? The, the Internet's not going away. We either live with it and adapt with it and, and discuss it, or we can't put it away. And I think we have that sort of weird sense that once you take away these anger points... You live with it. The clan devolves. The moment passes. And there is a tacit acceptance that this is uh, sort of uh, the mood. And the further you get away from World War I, the sense is, is that you don't really have to do that. It's interesting to note, too, is that there's a real rejection of World War I. It isn't full-out isolationism. That's really not the best way to talk about the 20s and 30s because we still are involved with the Kellogg-Briand Pact. We're going to ban war and all that good stuff. But at the same time, that moment passes. Um, you know, I, can, I noticed it in student culture, uh, Grand Valley uh, students love right, my professor. When I got there in 2004, it, people were nuts for it. Almost no one talks about it anymore. I went, and we used to be the number one school. We've tumbled way off that, that rate. We don't know we used it anymore. So it's interesting. I think there's these, these kind of sine waves that come through. Uh, the Klan will devolve and will join, eventually join the German-American Bund, the, the silver shirts, the American Nazi party in the early 1940s, and the federal government is going to end out literally, along with, along with uh, the radio priest Charles Coughlin, who uh, is also uh, kind of espousing, you know, staying out of World War II, kind of, the federal government kind of comes with a baseball bat and beats him over the head in and, and prisons and squishes him pretty effectively. So it's, the, the Klan's going to go away. The Klan comes back in the, in the 50s, and that's also something to remember. When you see people drive around with the, the battle flag of the Army of Northern Virginia, the orange and the stars and bars, that's not the Confederate flag, that's the battle flag of the Army of Northern Virginia, Robert E. Lee's, um, that has nothing to do with the second Klan. It has nothing to do with sympathy for, necessarily with sympathy for the, 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 the Civil War. It has everything to do with that. It's a symbol of white segregation and white supremacy that is, emerges in the 50s. If you ever look at the flags and there's all that sort of hullabaloo down south, I have a friend of mine who teaches in Alabama at Auburn University, and he says, yeah, every time I drive down there, there's a Confederate flag. Um, he got really interested. He had students that were just enraged at him because he said, you know, <laughs> the Confederate flag in the Army flag of Battle Flag of Army Northern Virginia wasn't flown until 1953 just before the passage of Brown. So the flag was actually brought back, something that they had put aside. So that's a very interesting component. We kind of miss these sorts of subtleties that go in there. Does it mean it's any less hateful? Absolutely not. In fact, it's even creepier if you think about it. it you, for me, I sit there and go, Yowza, it's even harder than you think. So it's kind of a component. But that's why the Klan kind of splutters out. Any other questions? All right. I'll start down here in front. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Professor Daly, uh, for your speech. 
Um, I would like to know that, um, I, I can't remember, I was young. When was the last Klan rally in Grand Rapids, Michigan? Was it in the mid-1990s, perhaps? I'm thinking that I remember seeing a newspaper flash when I was around nine. And I was also told by a family member that most Klan's men, or most Caucasian that thought in a Klan's mind, moved up north in up north Michigan. Is it true that up north Michigan is still somewhat segregated or racial bias? Yeah, what you find is that um, one thing for Michigan uh, on, a, on a simple answer is that the population of Michigan runs basically along the M46 line from uh, Bay City, Saginaw over to Muskegon. And you go north and it's Mayberry. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's small town America. Remember the biggest city has got about 20,000 people. I mean that's it's very small. There's a big geographic split. Uh, on the other hand, there are African-American farming communities in Lake County. Idlewild, the famous resort community, is also in Lake County. McBain and Baldwin. So there's, there's isolated pockets, and there were African-American communities further north, um, partly because land was cheap and there's other sorts of, 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 of uh, issues. Uh, now, when we think of the modern-day Michigan militia, which is headquartered in Montmorency County, uh, near where I grew up, uh, I can tell you that not necessarily is everybody like the Michigan militia, because they tend to ignore everyone else's property rights when they conduct their little exercises. Uh, people get kind of hacked at them because they just kind of show up and your house is there and there's a guy with a gun that shows up in your backyard. That was a big flap about three years ago. They did that. And the Montmorency County Sheriff's Department kind of landed on them with all, with, with basically the SWAT team and the whole nine yards. As a friend of mine who, who, who lives in Atlanta commented, he said, yeah, I said, we thought, this was the first time that we ever used the SWAT team, but they were all excited to go chasing down after these guys. They thought it was the terrorist invasion of Montmorency County. And some of the newspapers do view them as kind of a creepy kind of entity. Michigan does have that tradition of being uh, very segregated. Uh, Michigan is perhaps probably one of the most segregated states in the United States. Uh, we do have that, that, that very ugly legacy. Um, that's true for Detroit and a lot of other areas. It's also true uh, across the entire state. Uh, there's been a long tradition of that sort of uh, experience. Uh, when was the last Klan rally in Grand Rapids? Uh, I believe it was in July of 1996. And they're going to have them, and then they push them down. They're going to have them. And uh, there's always, uh, I think in that one, the counter rally was actually larger than the actual number of of supposed Klansmen who showed up. And even then you have, and today you have this, this mess, you have the Church of the Creator, you've got the, the Aryan Nation movement, the white power, I mean, it's, and today actually the, the, the so-called Klan is actually based much more in the prison system. Uh, the white power is gonna take on the trappings of a church. It's gonna kind of have that sort of, sort of uh, structure imposed to it. It looks a little bit more like a gang than almost anything else. So that's kind of a, a very unpleasant uh, phenomenon. Uh, the city, uh, the state itself is very uh, segregated partially because as you go north, the population drops off. Uh, it's, it's interesting to remember that Grand, Metro Grand Rapids has about a million people. Uh, Southeast Michigan has about four million. So between those two areas, that's five million people out of about nine and a half, close to 10. So you can think about that's four million. And then if you take the other million that's around uh, the Bay County, uh, Bay City, Saginaw, Midland, Flint area, Okay, that's six, and so you've got three million. You just have to spread the rest of them out across an area that would take you longer to drive from. Uh, it takes you it's the same amount of time to. Uh, it takes you longer to drive from Detroit to Ironwood at the western end of the UP than it does to drive from Detroit to New York. So it's a very heavily rural area, uh, and so there are a lot of students that I encounter who have come from areas that have never encountered uh, African Americans or Latinos. I went to Bay City Western High School. And I went, and my school had 1,500 students, my graduate class of 500, and we had two African-American students, period, in the whole school. And we lived between Midland and Bay City and just north of Saginaw. And I always thought that was one of the strangest components. Now, where, was it segregated because everybody had moved there? Uh, actually, uh, the sense was is that it, we took over half of Bay County. And when you went north, there were only 800 or so people in a township. And so partly it was demographics and partly it was how, now basically Central had more, had a larger African American, Latino and Asian community because it was the city. Where we were, it was farmland. So it's, it's hard to say. And that wanders into the zone of do you go anywhere? Uh, when I taught at the University of Detroit, I had students who would not go north of uh, basically uh, Pontiac because the sense was is that it was uh, outlying. And so it's, it's a tense kind of experience. Uh, and I think that it, it's tough. On the other hand, uh, a friend of mine uh, coached, coached football at Flint Northern, and they actually went and played Marquette High School in the Upper Peninsula. Marquette paid for them to come up there and play. And I, and I asked him, I said, so how did that go? 
And he went, really well. And I said, really? He goes, yeah. They were like, we don't know anybody like that. That's kind of cool. He says, well, I say the CUNY, and, and they thought it was a very different sort of experience. So it wasn't, neither group, I think, it, none, none of it, what happened was what they expected. So in a certain sense, it was, you know, learning was a golden moment there. They kind of had a chance to encounter different people. So that's a sensibility. On the other hand, there's, a, there's also an African-American community and Latino and South Asian and also uh, a traditional East Asian community in uh, Sault Ste. Marie near Lake Superior State, uh, Marquette and Northern Michigan University, and a very large one at Michigan Tech in uh, Houghton and Hancock, uh, the big college towns up in the Upper Peninsula. So that is also something. Uh, the northern part of the state up here has no four-year institution. So what it means is, is that you, where you have those nodes where you would have people you wouldn't expect living, the northern part of the state doesn't. And the northeast part of the state is very poor and it is the le one of the least populated areas. So that part of the demographics, because partly there was, as I always asked my mom, who asked me if I was going to move back up there, my question was, and exactly what would I do? <laughs> you know, you don't need that many people for farming. You know, kind of extra, extra help. But yeah, the segregation is definitely part of our state's legacy that we don't talk about very much. Okay, we have about five minutes left. I think we could take one more question. Thank you. Um, I remember you saying something about um, our president, Truman, wanting to possibly join the Klan. Um, what kind of advice would you give us as, as far as polit or politics or politically? Like, do you think that the Klan is still or still like a real, well, tremendous force in politics of today? My answer for the Klan of t today would be uh, only in certain areas. The most significant one would what it was uh, in the 1990s, David Duke uh, ran in Louisiana. And uh, Duke uh, is from uh, suburban uh, New Orleans. He ran both for state senator, he ran for U.S. senator, he ran for governor. And he got a lot of votes. Uh, in fact, the Republican Party actually, uh, National Republican Party in, I believe, in the mid-1990s, uh, and it was 92, openly ran and supported and gave money to the Democratic candidate just so it would defeat David Duke because Duke ran as a Republican. And the National Republican Party, I have a, this great image I should bring it with me on another time I do this, that it was basically saying, the National Republican Party does not support David Duke. We are fully opposed to, we are the party of Lincoln. And I thought, well, you don't see that every day. Vote Democratic. And I thought, whoa, that's a little different. You know, so there is a sense that, that certainly there is that. Does it play a role in there? I think as an, as an organized sense, the answer would be no. Do the sense of racial politics, the anti-affirmative action that the state of Michigan, uh, Prop 2 passed, uh, yes, that sort of stuff does. But it's not... There's not an, a controlling idea behind it. It's a hodgepodge of ideas that still gels together. So I think that still plays um, a great role. On the other hand, it's Barack Obama. And uh, I don't, and, and seriously, I mean, there's all this sort of, you know, I, I, I feel almost kind of bad for him. No one's going to be able to achieve the level of hype the poor man has gotten. On the other hand, um, I'm pulling for him. On the other hand, what's really interesting is that uh, there's a huge, no one saw him coming. That's part of the whole discussion. They're going, where did he come from? That's very interesting. That's a very new wrinkle in American politics. So whether or not you support him, the sense is, is that, wow, somebody's voting for, for, this, for this candidate. And he has that sort of appeal. That's a very interesting thought. So irregardless of that, and that's something that's very interesting. Alan Keyes, uh, who ran uh, as an African-American, ran uh, for the Republican Party as a sort of very traditional conservative you know, giving a certain level of credence to uh, Republicans um, uh, being the party of Lincoln, the traditional party of African Americans. Uh, it won't be until the 1930s that African Americans, uh, 1936 actually, the African American vote in 1932 went to Herbert Hoover. It didn't go to Franklin Roosevelt. African Americans will not vote for Roosevelt until 36. That's going to be when the majority vote goes over towards being Democrat, to, to vote for the Democrats. That's going to be a big appeal. Remember, the Republican Party until the 30s was the party of Lincoln, the traditional freeing the slaves and the like, and, and the Emancipation Proclamation. That's going to have the resonance. The Democrats are going to be viewed as anti-African-American, anti, uh, anti uh, party of immigrants, going to be playing those different sort of divisive, and it was the party of the South. That's going to be part of that New Deal coalition that, that, that you've probably heard of. So that's going to be a very uh, critical component. But it's still within there. It's... it's uh, 
these sorts of ideas are, are with us and backlash about that still goes on. But the Klan is a, as an organized political entity, um, it depends on where you're at and it depends on the strength. But for uh, Michigan, I think simple bigotry would probably pay a lot more of a role than the Klan, which is probably even worse because you can deal with an entity, you can squish it in its own way, but it's harder to do it when you have a kind of just grab bag of ideas. All right, let's uh, give Dr. Daly another round of applause. Thank you, been a great audience. Thank you so much for coming and uh, sharing his wisdom with us and celebrating um, Black History Month. And we hope to see you all at some of the other sessions that we have this week. Again, there are flyers on the right as you exit on the table up there.